So this week was function operators. It's a short chapter, chapter 11. Um, fortunately, it was short, uh, so I could get through most of the material. This does, again, assume that uh, you read it. If you haven't read it and something on here doesn't make sense, or just have the book open and reference it. And just stop me if you want to break something down and go into more detail with it. So function operators, uh, there's something off of my screen here. So a function operator is a function that takes one or more functions as input and returns a function as an output, similar to a function factory. Uh, function operators allow you to factor out complexity in order to make your code more readable and reusable. Uh, so this table here shows you how a function factory and a function operator are different in that a function operator requires a function as an input, whereas a function factory doesn't necessarily require a function. And it's similar to a function factory in that it outputs a uh, function and like functionals that output vectors. So uh, I borrowed this presentation from Tony L. Hopper from the first cohort. And he had this conceptual schema of function operators that I thought uh, was had some useful names of the categories of function operators. So function Behavioral function operators are those that change the behavior of, fun of a function. This memoirs package that we used basically memorizes previous outputs based on the inputs. Uh, so you can memoize a function and it's going to save in memory each output each time it runs, which we'll see later leads to some speed ups, especially if you're running something multiple times. And then an output function operator wraps a function and changes the output. Per has a number of these, possibly safely and quietly. And then an input function operator that pre-fills arguments of a function. So partial, this actually was not in the reading, but it's a useful thing to know. And we'll have examples of how each of these is used momentarily. So this is a general example of how a function operator works. So we have a function with two inputs. F is a function, N is a sleep delay. And it's outputting a function here with uh, all of the arguments that are added, uh, which would just be N and F. So it first just checks if n is numeric and messages that it's what it's doing, sleeping for a certain period of time, then it actually sleeps. And then it runs the function that was passed. So we can use a functional and walk along this vector of hello world. And as we can see, it does what you would think it would do. So the existing function operators are useful when mapping over unpredictable inputs or trying various attempts at something. And so some of the like use cases where this would make sense to use off the top of my head were when you are mapping over files uh, where the input is highly variable. You don't know what's gonna be in each file. It's like a large corpus of files and you could have nothing in a file or, and that would lead to an error or you know, it could be a different type of file. Uh, manually input data, so data where there might be human error and you might not be getting a value that you are expecting to parse properly. Um, survey responses is one of these places where, especially if you have like a free entry field in your survey, uh, and you're gonna get input that may be really unexpected. Um, this would be a good way to use like safely or um, 
possibly. Uh, so you can account for variations from what you expect. Uh, web pages that are liable to change over time and scraping code that might fail uh, when you're moving through multiple websites and scraping something. And also statistical modeling generally and across imbalanced classes, say in like a survey response data set and one class, say you're doing some kind of regression or chi-squared across the data and one class has, you know, one uh, observation in it and your statistical model call will just fail. Uh, and you don't want to lose all your other statistical models, especially if they were expensive. So this is a place where like safely or, um, or possibly will be really useful. And we'll look at an example with files towards the end of this. So here's a simple example of how to use per safely. So we're just taking the state x77. I don't know why it has x77 as its name, but it's a built-in R data set. If you look at it, it's just the states and some statistics about them. And we're just gonna make the row names because it's a matrix as it comes default in R, we're just gonna make it into a data frame and we're gonna make the row names uh, into a column. So, they're, so we can even work with them more easily. And we'll make a function where we're gonna search for a state uh, based on an input dot x. That's the default argument when you're using Arling as function, just like a default input argument. And if or any could be used here, if any of those are true, if there's a match, oops, then subset the state data. And if not, um, throw an error that says no match. So if we map along this character vector of states, uh, we get to Puerto Rico, which is kind of a state, but kind of not, and we get no match. So we have an error there. So we can use safely to get around this in an interesting way. So we call per safely on this function and get a new function out. And when we use this new function, we can see that we get the resulting subset of the data frame. And then on this last one, we don't get a result. Instead, we get an error and we get the data contained in the error. And so safely always outputs this result error list uh, for each object that goes into it. And Hadley demonstrates the use of transpose, which is just learned about that. And I wish I had known about it before because I've kind of done this manually many times. It transposes it. So if you have a bunch of individual lists that each have the same items in it, you can transpose it and it clusters those individual items, the same name of individual items uh, into one list of all that type of item and another list of all, you know, subsequent types of items. So that's pretty useful. And we can look at the output uh, as if we just bind the rows of that transpose output, it's going to automatically just omit the, the error one because there wasn't a result there, it was null. And we get our stats for our states. This was supposed to be on another page, but I don't know why I cannot possibly make Sheringen put it on another page. I don't know, I tried everything. Anyway, uh, possibly uh, is nearly identical to the functionality of safely, only it does not output the result error list like this it will output the results and it requires the otherwise argument where you specify a result that will be output in the instance of a failure. Uh, so in this case, we'd put like a data frame row with all in A's and we would see that, you know, one of them was omitted, was had no match and 
Uh, it does not return the errors. It will print the errors if you turn quietly to false. It's the quietly argument for safely is normally, or for possibly, is normally true, which will not throw the errors into the console and let you see them. But you can set that to false and it will throw those errors into the console so you can see where it actually erred as it's going through. Uh, quietly is similar to safely, except the list will output the results, the output, the messages, and the warnings. Uh, so it just gives all kinds of status messages. And if uh, you walk through the exercises, you would see that as you might expect, uh, the functionality inside of these functions is try catch. So it's just catching stuff with try catch and it's putting into a list as the output. So the memoirs, a memoirs, I don't, I think that's how you pronounce it, is a caching function that saves the output to memory. So we can see the slow function just sleeps and then multiplies times a random uniform distribution, a number from a random uniform distribution. So slow function one, slow function one. So, and then it does the same exact, even though we're calling it again, it has about the same amount of compute time. Whereas if we use the memoize and we memorize the output, we can see that it takes about the same time. And then the second time we call it, it takes half the time because it has memorized it. So continuing looking at that, uh, even if you change the inputs, it will still happen quickly. So right here, we call it with 22 and then 20 or 33 and then back to 22 and it takes zero time to compute this time. And it's going to continue to do that throughout the session unless you use memoirs forget. Um, I guess it's important to note that that means that somewhere in your RAM, your memory, that is going to be stored. And that's something to take into account. There was an exercise question on like, if you're using download file, should you memoize an output that outputs the actual downloaded file? And I didn't look at the answer, so this may be wrong, but. My immediate uh, impression was no, because if you're, if the download file, my downloaded file might be very large and you're gonna be saving every single one of those in memory, it might max out your memory and cause R to crash fairly quickly. Um, so yeah, that's just something to keep in mind is the memory usage that might come from such a function. So partial is really straightforward. Uh, and I wish I had known this existed for a long time, but here we go. So it will allow you to just set an argument to always be a certain value. So we can look at a example with our norm and we'll add an NA value in the second uh, list object and we'll map over with mean. So we get an error there. So we can partial mean and make uh, the NA remove argument true. And we're going to call that partial mean. And if we map over with partial mean, we see that it omits the NA. So there we go. Useful function. So this is number five, which I thought was an interesting example. I don't know that I really actually got to what he was asking for here, uh, but I attempted to. Um, so the question is modify delay by so that instead of delaying by a fixed amount of time, it ensures that a certain amount of time has elapsed since the last function was called. That is, if you called blah, 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 there shouldn't be an extra delay. Uh, so my approach to this was just to record the time that the function enters, that it starts, and then add the delay from the point it entered the function, whatever delay was specified, and then subtract that from the system time and print a timestamp. And then inside of this function, we are gonna delay for whatever amount of time is left. 
and then print another timestamp and then run the actual function that was input here. So when we run this and we put a diff time of four seconds, uh, we can see that at 4, 48 and 19 seconds, that first timestamp fired and then the second timestamp fired uh, for roughly four seconds later. But yeah, the part that confused me was like, if you put one F and I had remembered the delay by having a different order of arguments, like F was first. So I didn't really know what was, what he was asking for there. Uh, so anybody know? Uh, I looked at the answer and it's pretty similar, except for they considered the case when amount was negative, you don't want to sleep any. Oh, like, yeah, got it. Yeah, that's true, because it would be sys sleep like negative something, and it'd probably just error in this thing. Yeah. Cool. That makes sense. Okie dokie. So, uh, per safely demo. All right, so here's a use case for per safely that after right after reading this, I was like, oh, sweet. I didn't know how to do that, and I was causing my function to error frequently. And I had actually posted on GitHub like with an issue that I thought was coming from uh, the pa a package that I was using, but it was actually me using try catch wrong. <laughs> so I learned something there. But so this function, parse document, uh, we don't need to go into depth, but basically what it does is it will go through an R or an RMD document and it will take a, it will parse through all the lines of code in it and it will return a data frame with every function that was used and the number of times it was used and every package that was used and the number of times it was used provided that all the uses are in this colon colon format. Um, it's something I've been using to kind of quantify the uh, experience I've had with R over time. And there's a lot of files on my computer, some of which have weird stuff and errors and are empty. And I found this was really an error prone process and so I was trying to use try catch to resolve errors in a background process. And I wasn't doing it very skillfully and it kept on erroring. So um, eventually I used safely. So this just grabs all of the R and R and D documents from all of the directories on my computer and then uh, this creates a background job. It, it really just writes the code, this code to a background script. Um, so we use safely on parse doc. And then we map over all of the RMD and R files with this safe parse. And right here, it just runs the script and that worked. I was able to get all of the files and omit the errors um, when there was like empty files or something was wrong with the file and get a rough estimate of the number of functions and the number of times I used it in packages and the number of lines and everything that that function does. So that's a, a use case scenario there. Okay. And yeah, thank you to cohort one's Tony L. Haber. This was originally his presentation and I just modified it. So that's it. Good job, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it was super, super short chapter. I'm glad it was short because I forgot to read it again.
<laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, I think it might have been the shortest chapter yet, which is probably like a premonition of like really long and complicated chapters coming next. Oh, base types. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, I think who who is next? Who's doing S three? Roberto, are you doing S three? Yeah. So we we supposedly had a intro to object oriented programming, but then I read, I like, have a look on chapter ten, and he kind of mentioned some ideas of what is uh, like object oriented programming. So I'm thinking if we still want that or. We just go with chapter 10, then no, chapter 12, and then 13. Yeah. And if mm -hmm. there are doubts of how that works, we can take time and just kind of go back. So I was gonna ask everyone how you feel about object oriented programming. Because then uh, during this chapter, I think, yeah, during your presenting next one, which is the introduction. I think that's a nice overview and that might be enough. Uh, but I've seen some cohorts have taken two weeks for the object-oriented object -oriented, uh, chapters. And we can do the same thing if we think that we need more time. But yeah, um, I will do S3. And I'm looking forward to it because I've been using it for some time now. Maybe not all, all of the things, but at least the uh, use method so that you have a, you give a class name, then you uh, class that something. Or no, like print that, the name of your class. So then you have a generic method. So yeah. I I'm thought definitely this was looking forward to factor. it. Yeah. Um, I I didn't know about the transpose and I was doing something similar <laughs> that I wish I knew about transpose. Right. And I was like, damn it. I didn't like, I didn't function to yeah. drag all the list. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've definitely done like a map depth pluck, like some combination of those to get all the ones with the same name. Exactly. Same here many times. Uh, it's so yeah, nice. I'm looking forward to There's the so S3 things. chapter. <laughs> I've like failed. I've attempted to use S3 three times now, and I have never gotten it to work. So I'm looking forward to that chapter. Like making your own S3 class or what? Uh, yeah, and having like a method actually work. Like I can't figure out how to like get the arguments to pass on to the method. Mm -hmm. it, like I haven't been able to figure out how to make that work. Yeah. And I guess most things are S3, right? Like, I don't yeah. know, at least in my experience. Yeah. But I've never like made a package or anything, I made my own class. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, and I think it's not too complicated, but we'll see <laughs> when it comes. Um, I personally used it for a package to uh, do queries with SQL. So, because then you have a table, so for each table I did a class, and then for each class I have a different insert method, because then I want to pass a data frame or a table with that particular class. And so I said insert, and then it knows where it's going to insert that without me telling it. Huh. So it's just trying to make life easier for me. <laughs> yeah, I ran into an issue the other day trying to make like a meta class. So it basically like builds on top of a, a civil, uh, like a time series civil. And I thought that in making like 
the structure is basically a Sybil with an extra class name and it has two new attributes. I thought that all of the methods that work for normal Sybils would like work on that because it, it has the same classes as a Sybil, but it actually doesn't like it fails uh, mm. when I try to use like the Tibble methods and I don't know why that is. If, does anybody know why that would happen? No. <laughs> no. I'm not I sure could guess they... a lot of things, but. Because <laughs> I've seen that, that I have, I had the table and then it has three classes like TBL and data frame, I think, and there's another one. But then I saw that you can say like class and just give it any name, like class uh, rabbit and then you can have a generic method that understands rabbit so like print that rabbit and it will understand that object and i think table still understands those because then it has the table class um but i think uh that's something i haven't looked into there's a dispatch in the s3 um uh, dispatch method. I don't remember the name, but I think that's what it goes through the classes of an object and selects the appropriate, the uh, yeah, the corresponding method. If that makes sense. For cool. well, hopefully we can answer those questions. Yeah, dispatch something. Uh, I don't remember. It's, uh, method dispatch maybe. Because mm. I know there's use method, uh, it's one. No, no, let's see. Three. Get methods for dispatch. Dispatch. Um, dispatch. This cool. It says here in the in the book that you have to use use method, but I read somewhere else that you have to use something with dispatch. Uh, oh. right. Yeah, because this is like this is what I did. It just like adds two new uh, attributes mm -hmm. to the structure, and then I just add. The original classes, table TS, table DF, table data frame, and then add on this new class that I'm haven't completely decided on a name for. But yeah, when I tried to use table add row, it just won't do it. It just hangs. Mm. Um, because I I was hoping that it would like mm. inherit all of the methods for all of these subclasses because they are there. Um, yeah. But it it doesn't. Interesting. Um, this, um, yeah. So I ended up having. Did to, you try? Yeah. Huh? Sorry. I was gonna yeah. say, did you try to to test uh, that same method without adding the extra class? Um, oh, where let me see. Uh, oh, I know why is the reason, I think. So, you have this ad row that then line 43. Yeah, I think you have to create a function that's called ad row, and then inside you put uh, use method. So, for it to work, yeah. You have, you have to add another function before. So before the add row, that, that TS, TC yeah. uh, you have to add another function called add row. 
Yeah, and then it it needs to like, I mean, how do I, I, I want to inherit all the methods that Tibble already made, the Tibble package already made. I um, think it does have to so. add this. It will do it automatically. So, yeah, so add row and then do like function. And then I think it's, it starts with that data, yeah. And then, uh, and then inside just put use method. And then add row. I think you need quotation marks, maybe. I see. Pretty sure. Yeah, I think you're right. But yeah, I mean, I added this just to like remove that class, then run add row, and then add the class back, which seems kind of silly, but like that's what I had to do because Tibble wouldn't add row, Tibble add row wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then you have to add the, um, there's a special tag, RD name, that you have to add in the proxy gen documentation. RD name or R RT name? RD. Yeah, RD, RD yeah. yeah. And that just has to reference like table app row, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll try that out. Yeah. Just, uh, I was going to show you uh, my code. But yeah, I think we can. Try that out, uh, and uh, if not, we can just come back during the history chapter. Okay. Like, then, uh, I was good. thinking we could do like a small kind of package thing. Not a package, but just have like multiple generics or some some class that we can play around with it. Yeah. Um, the other thing I ran into with them was like, if you have some other variable here, like mm. the method didn't seem to be able to see this variable. No, it won't like it because then it complained. Uh, you can only have one and then the dot, dot, dot. Yeah. But then in the at row, that's where you name the other uh, parameters. So in, oh, down here in your line forty eight, yeah. Oh, so if you put then you like can after, exactly, yeah. Huh. Okay, I'll try that. Maybe I just did that wrong. I think I tried that, but maybe I didn't. I'll have to go back to where I was doing that and see if that works. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Anybody have any wins for the week? As Torin seems to have an avid gamer that likes to game during this time. <laughs> That's my boyfriend. He's been like, <laughs> he lost his job. And so it's like back in March. So he just does what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been like, this is a really fast moving screen back there. <laughs> it's, um, I don't know. I forgot what it's called. Warframe or something. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay. So, am I going next week now? Is that what Roberto? Okay. Yeah. If you are fine with that. Uh, yeah. Because then I think uh, your chapter covers what I was planning to uh, like go through, like an introduction to object oriented and the different approaches. Because I think that's what it is. It's it, it talks about what is this this three is S four and R six. Just like briefly, and then he jumps on to S3. It looks really short. So if that works for you, then. 
Yeah, it should be good. Cool. We're all set. All right. Well, I mean, there's not much else. This is a short chapter. I guess we can call it. Thanks, folks. Yeah. For tuning in. Thank you for presenting. <laughs> yep, no worries. Hope you all have a good evening. You too. Thanks. Bye bye. Have a good too. Bye. Stay safe. <laughs> you all be safe.